We're going to go into the book of Genesis, chapter number 29, and this is going to be our last week on, uh, I don't know what happened to my clock there. It ain't working. Okay, so I'm going to set this right now for 20 minutes. Okay. Now, now I'm going to pass it to you so I can keep an eye on it. You can put on the chair, whatever you want. As soon as I'm done reading that, that scripture, hit play on that. Okay, so... Um, this is our last week of a series we've been calling First Love. And um, man, how many have learned something about this story you didn't know? Right? We've been talking about Jacob and Leah and Rachel. And listen, if you think Love and Hip Hop season two was a trip, okay, you turn to Genesis 29 and you're like, man, this, this sounds like Jocelyn. Okay, this sounds like Jocelyn and Stevie. Anyways, if you're watching, you don't get that. But anyway, so um, I'm going to read a couple of verses here because we've read it multiple times. I'm not going to get into all the details, but um, I'll give you 20 minutes worth of what I have to share today. And then I'll give you some context, context for the content in verse number 17. We'll start there. Matter of fact, we'll start with verse number 21. Then Jacob said to Laban, who is his father-in-law, reading from the English Standard Version, he says, give me my wife now that I may go into her, for my time is now complete. So Laban gathered together all the people of the place and made a feast. But in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob. And he went into her. I'm skipping verse number 24, going straight to 25. And in the morning, behold, it was Leah. Somebody say, behold, it was Leah. And Jacob said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Did I not serve you for Rachel? Why then did you deceive me? Laban said, it is not done in this country to give the youngest before the first one. Complete the week for this one, and I will give you the other one, okay, in return for serving me another seven years. Jacob did so and completed her week, and then Laban gave her, gave him his daughter, Rachel, to be his wife. And then I'm going to skip down to verse number 30. So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah, and he served Laban for another seven years. If you're taking notes on a paper, paper and pencils, or if you're taking it in your app, today's message is going to be called One True Love. One True Love. One True Love. Okay, did you hit the timer? Okay. Let's pray. God, I'm thankful that the, the word brings light. I pray that this message would bring light to dark situations. Uh, I pray that it would help us to serve you and love you and honor you and Live a life that's pleasing to you because even when the things that we desire in this world we may not get, we have you. You're the one true lover of our soul, and that is unchanging. There's nothing we can do to get more love from you, and there's nothing we can do to lose your love. And we're grateful for that today. Everybody who believes it says, Amen. Amen. Okay. So, context for the context. Okay. So, Jacob is a trip. Okay. And Jacob is a broken man. Jacob ends up uh, fighting with his brothers, uh, he, one of his brothers, and he ends up uh, getting what he wanted, but he loses his family as a result. Because there is such thing as winning uh, uh, the argument and losing the relationship. And y'all act like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. There is such thing as you get what you want in the moment, but you lose what you want long term, right? There is something inside of all of us that Make sure, especially uh, if you're anything like me, if you ain't right, you don't even want to talk about it, okay? If you don't have the facts, you ain't even getting in the arguments, okay? Some of us, we be waiting, okay, for people to say something because we got all the receipts, we done already did the research, we know, and we are ready to combat them because the one thing that we refuse to be in all of our lives is wrong. I will stand by and some of us even when we're wrong and we're proven wrong because we refuse uh, to be anything other than right. We defend the wrong position because we've spent so much time and energy defending it that if we walked away from it, we would feel like a waste of time. And Jacob has been there and he is there. He goes to this new land uh, because he is looking for a fresh start. But how many can attest to the fact that if you go to a new place with the same mentality, you're going to find the same old thing. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was in, or 
graduated from high school in Minneapolis, that was the time where everybody was like, I'm leaving Minneapolis and I'm going to Atlanta where the players play and they ride on the things like every day. Let me tell you, it don't matter. It does not matter if you take the same mentality you had in Minneapolis to Atlanta. You're going to be just as broke in Atlanta. Uh-huh. You're going to be in, in the same miserable states because changing locations does not change your mind. Amen. Changing residence does not change your mind. And this is what happened to Jacob. He said, I gotta get a new scene. And he went over here. And the Bible says, as soon as he saw Leah, uh, excuse me, as soon as he saw Rachel, he loved her. The Bible makes it clear that she was beautiful. He loved uh, her face, he loved everything about her. And here's what we pick up in verse number 21, or even before I get to that, he said, I will work seven years for Rachel, which was an exorbitant amount. Okay, this was about five times the amount that people would work uh, to uh, obtain something or a, a daughter at this point. But he was thirsty. Y'all remember that term? Thirsty. I'm talking about Sprite. Okay? I'm talking about desperate. Okay? He was desperate at that moment. So the Bible says in verse number 21, he says something to his father-in-law that none of us would dare say to our father. He said, give me my wife now so I can put on the berry white. Okay? Give me my wife now so I can put on the Luther Van Dross. Okay? Give me the, my wife now. I already got the shot day playlist ready. Do you hear me? But the truth of the matter is, and I wrote this down because I thought it was important for you to know. I wrote it down and it says it this way. It says, when he sees Rachel and he says, give her to me now, he is emotionally and sexually overwhelmed with longing. Let me say it again. He is emotionally and sexually overwhelmed with longing. How do we know that? Because Jacob is willing to do anything to have her. He is willing to pay a price that is far above the price that he should pay. And he says, I'm willing to do anything to have her. So you might be saying, Alan Foster, why is Jacob emotionally overwhelmed? Why is he dealing with this? Because Jacob has been fighting battles. And every battle he loses, he picks up another battle thinking this is going to be the one that satisfies him. So he has been rejected from his brother. He, he has gotten the birthright. But when he got the birthright, he lost the tr trust and respect from his brother. Okay? The Bible really says that the only person who really loved him was his mom. And he loses his mom and she dies. Okay? Uh, so he's out here and he's doing his thing. And the Bible says he's just out here and he sees Rachel. And he says, I just need one way. And when he sees Rachel, he sees everything that he wants. And he says, if I can only get Rachel, I can get what I'm looking for. He sees Rachel and Rachel represents success to him. Uh-huh. Rachel represents the job, the dream job to him, uh-huh. Rachel represents the house on the hill to him. Rachel, Rachel represents the, the credential that he wants that, that will get him to the next level, right? We all have these markers in our life that we say, if I can just get that, I'll be all right. You single, and you like, if I can just get a, a, a honest, hard-working brother, okay? With two legs, okay? Maybe a beard, okay? I'll take a mustache, right? <laughs> I'll be satisfied. And you say, Lord, you know, I've been single. I just want a woman, okay, who, who when I ask for something to cook, she don't pull out ramen noodles, right? You, you may say, you know what? I've been struggling financially, and I just need to finish up this degree because when I get this degree, then I will have uh, what I want. Or you may be saying, you know what? Uh, I can't wait till my kids get into high school because then I can have more freedom. Or if you're anything like me, you're saying, I can't wait till y'all get up out the house. Glory to God. Come on, and I'll become an empty nester. Okay? And I'll walk around, and I can put stuff in the refrigerator, and I'll come back two days later. Glory! And it's still in the refrigerator. Hallelujah. I don't got to step on no Lego. Do you hear what some of y'all know what I'm talking about? Right? We ask so I almost fell. So if I was that he desires this thing. And 
And he says, if I can get this, I will be fulfilled. Uh-huh. If I can just get what is that thing in your life that you say, if I can get this, my life will be right. God, if you fix my relationship, my, my life will be right. If, if they apologize to me, my life will be right. If I get my income up, my life will, will be right. If, if I fix my marriage, my life will be right. If, if I get the blue check on Instagram, right, my, my life will be, if I can just make the dean's list, my life will be right. If, if somebody will just acknowledge me and see me, I will just be okay. But Jacob thought he knew what he wanted, and he thought that this one thing was going to fulfill him, but he was wrong. And how do we know he's wrong? The Bible says, and this is what I was going to call the message, but I decided not to. In verse number 25, the Bible says that in the most, so I, I gave the context last week, but I'll give it again just in case. So they're having a feast. So they is getting tore up from the floor, okay? Okay? They, I'm talking about everything's at the feast. They got E&J, okay? They got Old English. They got Cavassier, okay? They got uh, Bacardi. They got uh, Fireball, whatever you like, okay? They got Cosmigos, okay? All right, somebody, you online today. You was going to drive to church, but you didn't have too much, okay? So you still suffer, but that's okay, right? They, they were tore up from the floor, okay? These feasts last for hours and hours and hours, and some people say days. So Jacob is the, bra is the groom, so he, everybody giving him shot, he is intoxicated. He is overserved, okay? So he's wasted, okay? And it's dark, there's no electricity, and then there's a veil over there because some of us are like, well, how can he really be tricked? Listen, I got into it last week. Sometimes you don't even need no veil. You have a certain amount of shots of sun and you don't even know what your name is, okay? So the Bible says that he goes into the tent with Leah and he sleeps with Leah thinking Leah is Rachel. And then the Bible says, in verse number 25, and in the morning, Behold, it was Leah. What is the Bible trying to communicate to us? The Bible is trying to communicate to us that any time we put our success in anything, whether it be a man or whether it be a person or whether it be finances or whether it be a house or whether it be affirmation from your mom or, or whether it be an apology from your ex or whether it be a degree, the is letting us know no matter how much you want it, it will not fill up your heart. It is letting you know that even when you get it, and some of us can attest to it, you work so hard for it, and then when you get it, it's almost like you don't have it because you've shifted. You know what I'm talking about, right? I can testify myself. I work so hard to get my master's, uh, have my, my wife watching this and, 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 and proofreading this and proofreading that. And I said, so I get my bachelor's and I worked hard for it, okay? And then as soon as I got my bachelor's, what happened? Want, want the master's? You don't even think, I don't even look at the bachelor's no more. I don't even think about the blood and the sweat and the tears and the cheating I did to get it. Okay? <laughs> I don't even think about the fact that I had my, my daughter who was in college helping me, me with my math because I failed it not one time, not two times, but three times. And if I didn't pass they said, listen, you didn't waste a whole lot able to get the degree. And I worked so hard for it and I wanted it. And then I got it and my, sh my attention shifted to the next thing. And God is trying to communicate through the story of Jacob and Leah and Rachel that even though it's what you want so bad, when you wake up in the morning you will realize it's not what you thought it was. Uh -huh. If you're married you, you want to be married so bad and some of us are like, Lord Jesus why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me that it was going to be different than I thought it was? That it was going to be more than Instagram posts? And it was going to be more than happy anniversary posts? Uh, why didn't you tell me it was going to be more than going out to dinner when we actually had to live together? Okay? I actually had to, uh, uh, we actually have to find something to talk about. We actually have to agree with some things because it is difficult. And God said, I want you to know that it is not what you think. And that can be many things. That can be uh, uh, so many things to us. But he's communicating it is never what you think it is. And then what does Jacob say to later? He says, what have you done to me? And he says, why then have you deceived me? Because he tricked him. 
And he gave him what he did not want and held back something that he wanted. But the truth of the matter is that we learned this last week. Uh, go back and listen to the message. Well, I didn't post the message, but I'll post it today from last week. Uh, the truth of the matter is that when Jacob matured, when he looked at himself outside of trauma, he saw a new man, and he did not decide to be buried with Rachel, even though she was the beautiful one. He decided that even when I wanted this, God did not give me what I wanted. God gave me what I needed. And I don't know about you, but I am not uh, singing and worshiping. I'm not singing Christ as my first foundation. I'm not celebrating because God gave me everything I wanted. Sometimes my biggest praise and my biggest shout and my biggest hand wave and my biggest dance is not because God said yes, but every now and then I have to lift up a hallelujah because God said no. He said no to me when I thought he was making the wrong decision. Is there anybody who you ever asked God for something and you were mad because he did not give you what you wanted? But then a little bit later you looked around and you said, Lord, you know what you're doing. You know what you're doing. You do know what you're doing. You really love it. And that is an amazing love that will look at you when you want something so bad and be bold enough and brave enough to say, is going to bless you, but in the long term, it's not really going to do. So let me go down to the story of Leah here, because uh, Leah is unwanted. Jacob does not love her, but what's interesting to me, and if I had time, which I do not, I would talk about how Jacob doesn't want Leah, but he keeps sleeping with her. How Jacob does not find Leah beautiful, but he keeps on sleeping with her. He keeps on utilizing her for what he feels like she has to offer. But what we notice about Leah is Leah is looking to Jacob too, right? So Jacob is looking to Rachel, but he ends up with Leah. But Leah is looking to Jacob to do something. How do we know that, right? Because Jacob uh, marries Leah, okay, and the wedding happens, and he doesn't divorce her, and he still sleeps with her, okay? So, if I had time, I would, I don't even want to say that because you know, might get mad at me. But anyway, the Bible says in verse number 31 that when the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened up her womb with him. This is the message that God is always drawn to people who have been overlooked. Okay? They call you the ugly duckling, but God says, I have chosen you. Think about this. This is the dad getting rid of his daughter. He thought that the only way to get rid of her was to trick somebody to get her. That's how much he thought of his own daughter. He said, I ain't worried about Rachel getting uh, going somewhere. But Leah, I have to trust somebody to take her. So she is being overlooked. She is the black sheep of the family. She has been underappreciated. Uh-huh. And the Bible says in verse number 32, and Leah conceived a son, and she named him Reuben. What, what does that mean? Reuben mean? And she named him that because the Lord has looked upon my affliction. Okay, so she's been flipping. She's saying the Lord will look upon my affliction, but she doesn't stop right there. What else does she say in verse number 32? She says, for now, my husband will love me. So she has this man, she has this baby named Reuben, and she has him and calls him Reuben because she was praising God for him, but she really thought that this boy would help her to be seen. She said, if I have Reuben, he will see me now. He will love me now. He will see that even though he didn't want me, that I'm producing what Rachel can't produce. And she names him uh, Reuben because she's like, I want to be seen by him. But does he see her now? No. Because it never works that way. And then the Bible says in verse number 33, what happened to Gay? Okay? They didn't have, they didn't have the, uh, the baby face on another night. And the Bible says she conceived again. And she bore another son. And she said, I'm going to call this son Simeon. And she says, because the Lord has heard that I am him. He, in other words, she's saying, now I'm naming this son Simeon. Because I don't only want to be seen now. I want my husband to hear me. I want him to listen to me. So what is Rachel, I mean, what is Leah doing? She is looking to her husband to be the same thing that Jacob was looking for Leah to be or Rachel to be. But 
she ended up not being there. And she doesn't stop right there. Uh huh. And then in verse number 34, it says, and again, she conceived another son. And it's, it's significant that she's conceiving sons because sons at this time meant that the generation would continue on. That there was somebody to carry on the family name. And this was an important thing that she was doing. It says, now, she named this, not this last boy, but it says, now she named, named this son Levi. And why did she say that? Because she said, now this time, my husband will what? Attach to me. Why? So she's looking to be seen. I'm telling you what the Bible says. She's looking to be heard, and she's looking to be attached. She's, she wants what God is doing in her life, but she's also saying, Lord, I want this man to validate me. And God is showing us that, watch me, she is going about it the noble way. She's saying, I don't want to be in these streets. They used to call them fast back in the day. She said, I don't want to be fast. She said, I want to do things the right way. Uh huh. She said, I, I want the husband and then the baby. Okay? She said, I don't want no baby daddy. I want my baby daddy to be my husband. So what does she say? She's saying, I value family. All I need is my family. All I need is my kids and my husband and my wife. And I am satisfied and I'm good to go. But here's my question. She is a conservative. And she's saying, I'm going to do things the right way. I want the house and the car, and I'm going to be a stay-at-home wife. But guess what? That does not satisfy her either. Because anybody who you and I try to put in the place of God, God says, you cannot worship me and them. Mm -hmm. you, you, you cannot worship your husband and your kids and me. He says, either you put me in my rightful place or I have he said, when anybody you and I try to put in the place of God, they always fail. Some of our biggest disappointments in our lives are because we put God responsibilities on a man. Um. Or we put God responsibilities on a woman. Or, or some of us, I'm coming down your street, we put God responsibilities on our kids. Okay? Give me two more minutes. I promise that I'll be done. Okay? We put it on them. And we say, my life will have meaning if my kids do this. My life will have meaning if my kids turn out this way. But what will happen when your kids make a decision that you disagree with? What will happen when your kids marry somebody you show them don't like? What will happen when your kids, you pay for the college, you, pay, you still pay for the debt right now, and they in the basement making beats? Because once you put our identity in Christ, 
She had nothing else to prove. Yeah. Yeah. Once she put her hope in Christ, she didn't have to prove that she was worthy by bearing kids because there was a man who loved her whether she bore kids or not. There was a man that loved her whether she worked or not. There was a man that loved her whether she knew everything that she, she understood that I am loved by the Almighty God, by Yahweh, so it does not matter to me what other people say. Because in Christ, I am satisfied. Because in Christ, I am whole. Because in Christ, I'm the man that I know I need to be, so it doesn't matter what you think of me, because God loved me enough that he died for me. Last thing. So people say, listen, man, where's the moral in the story? The Bible's all about morals. Where are the people that are supposed to have morals? Let me tell you something. The reason why nobody in this story has morals is because morals don't get you to God. God comes to you and he gives you some morals. Let me say it again. Morals do not get you to God, okay? God says you come to me as I do for you what you cannot do for yourself. So when we worship, when we praise, when we honor God, when we live right, I'm not doing this to get God's approval. I'm doing it because I have God's approval. Okay? I did not not cuss you out because I need God's approval. I did not cuss you out because I have God's approval. And even if I did cuss you out, I still got God's approval. Right? I'm not telling you to cuss nobody out. I'm telling you that the love that God has for you, nothing can shake it. And until you understand that, you'll always need other people's validation. Okay? Let me tell you something. You need to live the rest of your life and say, you cannot validate me. You can encourage me. You can uh, remind me of things. But you don't have the power to validate me. Stand up all over the building. We were at a place a little while ago, okay, and we went to the back lab ballet, and, and I, uh, he said, listen, I'm the only person that can pay for your parking here. He says, you can go to the desk, and they can't do it. You can go to the bell. I'm the only person that the only way that you're going to get out of here scot-free is if I take care of it. That's what Jesus did for you. That's why you and I can put our hope in him. Because he has been abandoned. Okay? He's been rejected. Some people are still rejecting him today. And he says, I'm the only one that's strong enough to carry the weight of your expectations. I want you to bow your head. And I want you to think about some things that you've been putting your hope in, some people you've been putting your hope in, some visions you've been desiring, and some things. And you say, if I don't get this, I don't think I'm going to be all right. If I don't make this, I'm not going to be all right. If I don't make this happen, I'm not going to be all right. And God says, it doesn't matter when you have me. I will be more than enough. I will make a way out of no way. I will lift you up and I remind, remind you who you are. And I just want you to take a moment and think about that. And I want you to say, Lord, help me. Help me to put that weight on you. Help me to put the, my love for you. Help me to put my devotion in you. Help me to put my time and energy into you. Because you will never let me down. Let me pray and we'll be out of here. God, I'm thankful. I pray that every man, every woman, under the sound of my voice, I pray, God, that they would take the pressure off of their kids and put it on you. I take that. I pray that they would take the pressure off themselves. Hallelujah. Somebody's been hard on themselves because they expect that they're going to make it happen and they're going to pull it along and they're going to make it happen by hook and by curve. I pray, God, that they would put faith in you today. I pray that they would look to you and to know that you can do what they cannot do. Take it off their spouse, their mom, their brother, their money, their education, their credentials. It's nothing wrong with having all of those things, but we need to put those things under you and submit those things under you. Help us to live our lives that way. Help us to submit our will to you, our choices to you, our options to you, and to know that you are the one true love that we have found. And after we have you, we have everything. And if everybody in the world is against us and you're for us, we've got more than what we need. Help us to love you and to treat you with the dignity and the respect that you deserve. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. If you want prayer, I'll be up here for a few minutes. Otherwise, God bless you so much. Have a wonderful week in Jesus' name.